Our main text we're going to be learning about today was the main text of our students' camp last week. And it is so relevant for all of us, not just for students. It's so relevant for all of us, especially if you're in times of trouble, if you're in times of turmoil or the unknown. And so before we look at the passage, I want to give you guys some context as to why I think this passage is so awesome. And context is so important in the Bible. I think a lot of times we read the Bible and we don't understand the setting. We don't understand what is happening or when this was written. And because we don't understand, we miss out on some of the beauty and the richness of the passage in the Bible. And that's the true for Psalm 46. This is a beautiful passage, the passage we're going to be in today. And so I want to encourage you to, to kind of dig into what the context is here because it kind of gives us a new light and a new way to look at this verse in this chapter, and that's Psalm chapter 46, and the setting is this. It's 701 B.C., 700 years before Christ, and it's when the evil king of Assyria was attacking Jerusalem. That's the context. That's the setting of Psalm 46. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never lived in a city that was under attack from a foreign empire, from a foreign country. So if you are like me, then this is hard to understand. It's hard to relate to the Israelites because we don't know what it feels like to be under attack, to live in a city that is under attack, especially from an enemy like the Assyrians, which was famously brutal. You see, the context is so important here because it brings to life the passage that God is our very present help in trouble. And if you can understand what the Israelites were feeling and felt, then it will help you understand this passage a little bit better. You see, the Assyrian army was the most feared military force in the ancient world. They had the best weapons at that time in the world. Nobody had the weapons like the Assyrians. Not only did they have the best weapons, they also had the greatest generals. At that time, their generals were famous for how they could outmaneuver and outsmart and and their tacticians in battle and what they were doing to, to trick their enemies so they could easily conquer their enemies. And not only that, they also had an army that was famously brutal. These men were specialized, trained killers. They would devastate their enemy. They would humiliate their enemy. They sought the total destruction of their enemy. And these 185,000 men were efficient. They were devastating. Imagine like greater than Rambos. Like each one of these guys could like, they could pack a punch. These guys were brutal. And so all of that together means like this was an army you did not want to mess with. They defeated everyone they came in contact with. And this is the craziest thing. They didn't just do that. They also specialized in psychological warfare. They loved to terrorize their enemies. So they would do things like this. They would write tablets and they would draw pictures of just how once they defeated them, they were going to torture their enemy. Once we defeat you, this is what we're going to do to you. And then they would send that with the messenger ahead of the army to the cities they were going to announce that they're coming to attack them and that when we come, we're going to defeat you. Not only are we going to defeat you, we're going to torture you. And this is how we're going to torture you. And then they would leave those tablets there once they left as a reminder of just how they did exactly what they said they were going to do and how they did it, and here's living proof that they did it, and then they left, and there you go. They wanted to remind everyone. They wanted to strike fear in their opponents. They wanted to humiliate them. They invented all kinds of ways to not just psychologically torture, but also to physically torture. In fact, they invented the worst torture that I think you can invent, which was both torture and execution. And without being too graphic, here's what they would do. They would take a pole, imagine a big spear, and they'd stick it in the ground, and then they would put a person on that pole, and they'd impale that person. And that person then would slowly be tortured and pass away as that pole would go up them into their stomach, into their intestine, through their intestines, through their stomach, all the way up to their heart until eventually they would die. And then they'd have hundreds of these throughout a city. And then no one was allowed to touch them. No one was allowed to go close to the poles. And if you went close to the pole and you tried to mess with the pole or touch it or put that, take that person down, then they would string you up and they would impale you and then you would be an example of their cruelty. And so they wanted to strike fear in the conquered people. This is the Assyrians. They would skin people alive. They would cut off body parts and maim their enemies. They would take people slaves. They would cut off toes and fingers. They cut off ears and noses. And you know what they would do with them? All those 185,000 soldiers, they would put them on necklaces and they'd wear it as trophies to show how they dominated their opponents. These were brutal, brutal people. The king 
was evil. And this is the context that Psalm 46, 46 is written into in which these people are attacking the city of Jerusalem. If you can imagine, the Israelites are terrified. They're terrified. Picture with me a time of national turmoil. The enemy is here. They are a brutal enemy. They're looking to, to take your family from you. They want to torture you in front of your family and then torture your family and then realize that there's nothing you can do. Our armies can't match theirs. Our weapons don't match theirs. Our generals, we're outsmarted. We're outclassed. We don't have the gunpowder. There's nothing by our own power, our ability, or our mind where we can try to outmaneuver these guys. We're outdone. We're outmatched. We have no power by ourselves to stop this threat. Could you imagine the terror that they felt? And in the midst of this, in the midst of this terror, in the midst of this turmoil and trouble, with the enemy on the door telling them how they're going to attack them, how they're going to hurt them, and, and how they're going to torture them, in the midst of this terror, God shows up. In the midst of this terror, God speaks. And he speaks to us in Psalm chapter 46. And this is what he tells us. He reminds us and he reminds them who he is. That he is a God of hope. Even in the darkest of days, our God is a God of hope. He is a good God. Even when you're facing an enemy that is as brutal as the Assyrians, our God is still a good God. Psalm 46.1 says that God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. Our God is our refuge. In times of trouble, in times of turmoil, in the midst of the battles, and in our weakest moments, God is our refuge. Many times, as Christians, what we do in seasons of trouble, you know what we do? We turn to our own power. You know what we do? We turn to the power of our friends. We turn to the power of money or position. We try to run away from power. We try to escape, or excuse me, run away from trouble. We try to escape from trouble. We try to run away. We're looking for our own Sometimes we try to pretend like trouble's not there by seeking things of pleasure to distract us. We do all kinds of things. The last thing we do, finally, when our backs are against the wall, you know what we finally do? Then, Christian, what we finally do is decide to turn to God. Then, as our last choice, we turn to God. But that's wrong, the Bible says. The Bible says that God is our refuge, that when trouble comes, he should be our strength. He should be the one. You see, I can, can I tell you something? Anything outside of Jesus Christ is a weak refuge. Anything you turn to outside of Christ will not provide you safety. It will not provide you strength. It will not provide you hope. It will fail you. Anything less than Christ is a weak refuge. Christ is our refuge. God is our refuge. God is our safe place. He is our source of strength. If you find yourself in trouble, we are supposed to turn first to Christ and realize that he is always ready to help us in times of trouble. Not turn to other things first, but we turn first to our refuge, to our strength, to Jesus. Psalm 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and strength. And it says that he's always ready to help us in times of trouble. That he's always ready to help in times of trouble. Of trouble. I love this line, always ready. In other translations, it says it like this God is our ever present help in times of trouble. I just love this line because I, I think it's a beautiful word picture of how God is just kind of waiting for us to seek Him as refuge. That once we turn to Him, He's ready. It's even more beautiful if you look at the Hebrew and you see the original context and verse of how this is written. The, the Hebrew words here is two words together that mean ever-present or always ready, and that is nimsa miad. Nimsa miad. Let's say the first word together. Everyone say nimsa. Nimsa. Nimsa means to be discovered. It means to be encountered. It means to be experienced. In other words, I can't just tell you about this attribute of God. I can't just tell you how good God is. I can't give it words for you. I can't try to show you a picture about it. I can't try to show you a video about God. You have to encounter God for yourself. You have to discover the goodness of God for yourself. You have to discover his presence for yourself. You have to experience God and his goodness for yourself. I can't tell. I can't put it into words. I don't got the words to do it. It's the NIMSA. You got to experience it. Let me give you an example of this. Two years ago, I lost a bet in youth, and I had to go skydiving. And so I was watching videos on how to skydive. 
and what happens when you skydive and what it feels like to, to jump out of a plane and to fall to the earth and the terror involved. And I listened to testimonies and talked to people who had done it. And I'm like, okay, here we go. I'm going to go skydiving. And so when nothing had prepared me until the day I was on the plane, going up the circle, holding the door shut because the door was broken as I'm getting ready to jump out of the plane, nothing prepares you for that. I'm not even hooked up to a parachute yet. Like, what, is, what did I sign up for? Turn around, click in, guy's on my back. He tells me to stick my head out and jump. And the, the minute I jumped, it was NIMSA. It was something you got to experience. It was something you got to just do for yourself. You got to discover that feeling for yourself. No one can tell you what the adrenaline or the fear or the rush feels like when you go skydiving until you go skydiving. The same is true for the ocean. This last week, when we had our students go to the ocean, it was a lot of times, or a few of them, it was their first time to the ocean. And they'd never experienced the ocean before. They never discovered what it felt like to be in the water and discover what it feels like to have that water push up against you and then pull you, to push you against you. And the waves were kind of crashing that day. And they kind of felt for the very first time the power of the ocean and just realized, you know, what is it like to experience the ocean for the first time? Words can't put that into you know, description. You can't describe what that feels like. Movies and videos and pictures, they don't do a good job justifying just how vast it really is when you're in the middle of the ocean and you feel that power. You feel God and his creation and his almighty creation of the ocean. Like, man, this thing is huge and our God is that much huger. And you experience just the vastness of the ocean and the power of it. I can't put that into words. You got to know what that feels like for yourself. You got to experience it. Here's, here's my third one. It's my favorite example. Probably because it's about food. But my grandma's chicken, my grandma's fried chicken is the world's best fried chicken. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, Brennan, I've had fried chicken. You might have had fried chicken. You have not had my grandma's fried chicken. It is delicious. Some of you are mad at me because you're hungry, but it is delicious. I love my grandma's fried chicken. My grandma knows how to cook fried chicken. You want to know why? She's old school. She grew up in the Great Depression. She's old school. So when we want fried chicken... On a Saturday morning, she goes gets some live chickens and goes out back. You know where I'm going with this. She plucks some chickens. We have some fresh chickens that night. And, you know, she fries them up. You know, she got her little blend. Colonel Sanders got nothing on her herbs and spices. It's way better. I don't know what she puts in it. It's awesome. And then when she cooks it up in the pan and she makes us that fried chicken, she uses Crisco. Anyone ever, ever know what Crisco is? Remember Crisco, guys? It's terrible for you. Do not cook with Crisco. It will kill you. It'll give you a heart attack. But it's delicious. It's so good. And so when you bite into that chicken leg, I mean, it is, it's a feeling you got to experience. It's a taste you got to try for yourself. It's one of those things where everyone who's had my grandma's fried chicken says, that's the best fried chicken I've ever had. It's not like any other fried chicken. It is the best fried chicken. You got to discover it for yourself. That's the NIMSA. That's talked about here, that our God is a God that you have to experience for yourself, that you have to discover the goodness of God. You have to encounter him. You have to experience his goodness. And I pray that if you're in the midst of trouble, you will experience the goodness of God. You will experience the very real presence of God for yourself. If you've never encountered God, my prayer and hope is that today you would encounter God, that God's goodness would rub off on you, that you would get to experience him. Because here's the thing, once you encounter God, once you encounter him, no one can ever take that away from you. Once you've encountered the Lord, he'll change you. And it's an experience you can't walk away from. The Bible says that when you become a child of God, that no one can take you from his hand. That once he's yours and once you're his, it's over. It's done. You've encountered the Lord and he's yours now. You've been in his presence and now he's called you home. It's the NIMSA. The second word is miad. Everyone say miad. Miad. I love this one. It means exceedingly abundant. It means exceedingly much. One author says it like this, which is kind of funny. He calls it the exceedingly muchness of God. He's making up words. I love that. He said, we can't even describe it. We've got to make up words now. God's presence is exceedingly much. It's abundant. It's overflowing. You see, the goodness of God, the presence of God is overflowing. And if we, if we look at that with our verse, that means in times of trouble, God overflows with his exceedingly abundant strength. God overflows with his exceedingly abundant protection and provision for you. That he is overflowing with his exceedingly abundant refuge. 
That our God is a safe refuge, a place for you to go to seek protection and comfort from harm and anxiety and pain. Our God is ever-present and available to us. Let me tell you something, church. Our Christ is our refuge. Christ is our refuge, and he is exceedingly available to you. Not only is he a safe place, not only is the place that you should turn to first, but he's always ready for you to do it, and he's always there for you. He is available to you, always. Okay, so how does that apply today? As we face our own problems, as we face our own enemies, as we face our own trouble, as we face our own anxiety, our own stress, how does that apply to us today? Because we don't live in Jerusalem. We're not living under attack from the Assyrians. So how does it apply when the Bible says in 46.1 that God is our refuge, always ready to help, the ever-present help in times of trouble? How does that apply? Well, what's your trouble? What does that mean when you're overwhelmed with anxiety? What does it mean when you are stressed and you are overworked, so much so that you can't even rest at night? What does it mean when your marriage is hanging by a thread? What does it mean when your kids are living in in rebellion? What does it mean when your job is not safe? What does it mean when your faith is not as strong as it once was and you question, is God even real? What does it mean with your trouble when it says that he is our refuge and strength and that he's always ready, abundantly present, that you need to discover it and experience it for yourself. What does it mean? What it means is our God is exactly what you need when you need him. And because he's exceedingly abundant, it also means he's so much more. Our God is exactly what you need as your refuge, as your strength. He is exactly what you need when you need him. So in your moments when you need him, he's exactly what you need. And he's so much more. He's your nimsa miad. He's your ever-present help in times of trouble. The goodness of God that can't be explained, it must be experienced, that no matter what you are facing, our God is exactly, precisely what you need in that moment. And yet he is so much more. So what is your need? Who is God in your moment of need? What does your need look like, you think? How can God be who you need in your moment? The good news of God is that as our refuge, when you are anxious, God is the one who will give you peace. The good news of God is that as our refuge and strength, when you are hurting, our God is your comforter. Anytime you are lacking, our God is your abundant provider. If you have sinned against our holy God as the provider and refuge, our God is your righteousness. He is your salvation. He is whatever you need. When you're weak, he is your strength. Whenever you're hopeless, God is your hope. Whenever you're in trouble, he is your shield. He is your fortress. He is your rock. He is your defender. He is exactly what you need, and our God is more than you could ever imagine. He's exceedingly abundant. He is ever-present. Christ is our refuge. However you are hurting, our God knows exactly what you are going through, and our God knows exactly what you need to get through the pain. However you are hurting, whatever it is, our God knows exactly what you need to get through it. And not only is that the truth, he has also provided everything you need in and through his son, Jesus Christ. Everything you need is found in Christ. That is a strong refuge. Psalm 46 goes on to say in verse six that, As the nations are in chaos and their kingdoms crumble, God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. The psalm is singing about how God is among us when the world is crumbling and the nations are in chaos. Doesn't it feel like the world is crumbling? Doesn't it feel like everywhere, not just here in America, but everywhere the nations are in chaos? feels like, man, 2,700 years later, the nations are in chaos still. 2,700 years later, the kingdoms are still crumbling and falling away. And yet God is still the same God that he was then as he is today. He is our refuge and strength. He is our fortress. Our God is the Lord of heaven's armies. And yet the Bible says that he is here among us. 
In the New Testament, we say it like this, that God didn't stay up in heaven. He sent Emmanuel. He sent God with us. He sent his son, Jesus, who entered this world and offered salvation from the darkness, and he offered us light from our trouble. Jesus entered the fray. The sinless one who became sin for us died for us in our place so that we could know the goodness of God who will never leave us, who will never forsake us, the Bible says, because Jesus, the Emmanuel, the one who is with us, is our source of hope. He is our source of strength. He is our refuge from this fallen world. He is the refuge from the chaos in this world, from the kingdoms that are crumbling, from all the things that give us stress and anxiety and fear and trouble and pain. God is our refuge. Christ is our refuge. Verse 7 says that the Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. You know what it's saying there? It's saying that our God has access to everything. That he has the vastness of all of heaven's armies. He has the total universe at his control that he is sovereign. That our God has everything. And yet, he chose to be here among us and care about what's going on in our lives. You know what that means? Our God is sovereign over all, but he is so loving that he cares about you. He cares about you. He cares about me. He cares about every detail of our life, every small trouble, every big trouble. God, who is sovereign over all, control of everything, the planets and on all the whole solar systems, the galaxies, all of them are working in conjunction to his word and to his spoken power, and yet he is still concerned about the small problems of your everyday life because he loves you. Our God is the Lord of heaven's armies, and yet he's here among us. Our God is so good that I can't just tell you about him. He is so good that you have to experience him. You have to encounter him. You have to realize that he loves you. And what's so awesome is the very next verse that's talking about how God is sovereign over all, but he's so loving that he cares about you. The very next verse then says in Psalm 46, 8, says, Come and see the glorious works of the Lord. Come and see. It's an invitation. It's like, man, you need to experience this God. This God is our refuge. You need to seek him as your refuge. You need to dwell in his presence. You see, just just sit in his presence, just dwell in it. Our God is a good God. Just come see how good he is. Come see the glorious works. Just come see what he's doing. This is an opportunity for us to open up our hearts to God, to cry out to him, to run to him. Some of us today need to cling to him. We need to depend on him in the midst of our storms. Whenever you draw near, the Bible says, whenever you draw near to God, God draws near to you. Some of you guys need to hear that today. You know, when my girls cry out for me and they say, Daddy, I need you, I need you. At that moment they cry out for me, they have my attention. The minute they cry for me, they've got my attention, and I'm going to come to them, and I'm going to help them. The same is true for your God. In the moment you cry out for him, the ever-present, always ready to help in trouble God will show up. He's just been waiting for you to call on him. He's just been waiting for you to call, Abba, Father, Daddy, I need you. And he wants to be your refuge. He wants you to seek after him. He wants you to to choose him over other things. He delights to be there for you, the Bible says. He delights to be your rock. He wants to be your refuge. It goes on to say that he is our fortress. You see, God is exactly what you need him to be in your moments of need, and God desires that you treat him as such. He desires that you seek him as your refuge because anything less than Jesus is a weak refuge. Our God is righteous, he is just, he is sovereign, and he is loving enough to care about your life and your problems. So you don't turn away from God when you have bad things. So often, that's our temptation. When bad things happen, we want to blame God and we want to turn away from him. We want to run away from God. But instead, we're supposed to do the opposite. We're supposed to turn to Jesus, the one who is sovereign over all, the one who is so loving, he wants to be your refuge from trouble. He has the power and the ability to protect you. And he's loving enough to care about your problems while he's protecting you. He's going to fix them. He's going to take care of them. He's so loving that he cares about all your things that you got going on in your life, all your struggles, all your pain, and he wants to be that strong refuge for you. That is a strong refuge, a God who is sovereign over all, but also who came on this earth and died for you to be your refuge. 
Anything less than that is weak. Anything less than that will fail you. So why do we still turn to other things? Why do we still turn to other things? Our own power, our own ability. Christ is our refuge. Now the passage shifts focus here where it addresses just how great our God is and who our God is. And then it turns to tell us that because God is our refuge, here is what our response should be. And I'm gonna be honest with you, church. This is where it gets a little hard, okay? Because if we go from learning about how great God is and we learn, okay, well, this is what we should do because of his greatness and goodness. And it's important to the Christian life. This is incredibly important, but it's so hard to get here and have this response because it is so out of nature for us. At least it is for me. Because what this is asking you to do is really hard. Let me give you a picture again. Let's think back, okay? Remember back when the Israelites, they're under attack at 701 B.C. It's 2,700 years ago. So imagine with me, put yourself in that setting. So for me, I'm a dad and I am a husband living in Jerusalem. So for you, think about what you are in that setting. You're living in Jerusalem. The Assyrian army that you have feared since childhood is coming to attack you know exactly what they're going to do because they've sent those tablets to tell you how they're going to defeat you and torture you. And so here you are, powerless. You have no ability by your own power to protect your family, your kids, your wife. And my assignment from God in that setting is verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. That is hard. That is hard. When everything I value, everyone I love, everything I've spent my whole life building up is now in jeopardy, my whole life trying to protect is now in jeopardy, and God is telling me I can't do what I want to do as a man, which is fight for what's mine, which is protect what is mine. I have to be still. Okay, dad's in the room. It's Father's Day. If God was telling you to be still and your family was under attack, let's just say a man had a gun in your home and God told you not to fight them, could you do it? Everything you love is under attack. Wouldn't you want to protect them? And yet God is saying, no, 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 trust me, be still, and know that I am God. That's hard. As a dad, that's hard. And yet that is the assignment God is giving us. You see, I don't like to be still. It's so hard for me to be still. I like to go. I like to go, go, go. I like to do, do, do. That's just who I am. Even on vacation when you're supposed to relax, you're supposed to calm down, you're supposed to have a good time and just chilling at the beach, that's not me. I'm the guy with the planner. I'm the guy with the itinerary. My wife can tell you. I like to go do things. I like to go do, be active. You know, we sit at the beach for 30 minutes. I'm like, okay, I, I got my beach time. Let's go. Like, all right. She's like, well, that's why we came. I'm like, well, that's not enough. Let's keep going. I got to do more. I don't like to be still. Even at night, at bed, every night at bed, when I go to bed, I can't just fall asleep. I have to put headphones in my ears, and I listen to sermons, and I listen to books, because I don't like to be still. I need something. I can't shut my brain off. If I sit there with nothing on, I'll just think about all the things I need to be getting done right now, and I can't shut off. And so I don't like to be still. It's not in my nature. I'm about to get real with you guys real quick. I'm about to get raw, okay? So don't, no judging. Safe place. The reason I don't like to be still, the reason why it comes so hard for me is because when I am still... I am not in control. When I am still, I can't voice my opinion. When I am still, I can't be the guy that fixes anything. And I like to be the guy that fixes things. I like to be the guy that solves problems. But when I'm still and I take myself out, I can't be that guy. When I'm still, being honest, I can't be important. I can't be the main character. And I want to be. And yet God says, no, I am. You need to be still. You need to trust me. Dads, there are some battles that are not our fight. Church, there are some battles that only God can win. And there are some times and some seasons when your only assignment from God is to be still and know that he is God. Moms, the text here doesn't say, be worried It doesn't say know that he is God and be afraid. The text says be still. Church, it says, it doesn't say be freaked out. It doesn't say be stressed. 
It doesn't say have a lot of anxiety. It doesn't say be anxious about anything and try to control your circumstances. It doesn't say that. It says be still. It says relax. It says trust me. It says be set free from these things that you're worried about. Be set free from the trouble that you're harboring. Be set free from the pain and the anxiety and the fear and all the mental pressure. Be set free from the the battles in your life. Be set free from your exhaustion. Be still and know that I am God. The word still in Hebrew is another one I want us all to say together. It's rafa. But when you say it with me, I want you to say it like this. Let's all breathe in real big. And then as we exhale, let's say rafa. Let's try one more time. Breathe in. Rafa. It means to be quiet, to be relaxed, to give yourself a break. You know what God is telling us when he says, be still and know that I am God? God is telling you, take a break. Relax. I got this. This is not your battle to fight, Christian. Daughter, this is not yours to carry. Son, this is not your burden. It's mine. Be still. Relax. I've got it. This is above your pay grade. You don't have the IQ to figure this one out. You don't got the ability to stop what's coming. Only I do. God is telling us to take a break. God is telling us to trust him. You see, there are some battles that are just battles for the Lord, and your job is to be still. So give yourself a break. You don't have to try to control your circumstances. You don't have to try to figure it all out because God is big enough to oversee the whole world, but he's loving enough to care about your life and all the details of your life. So be still and know, trust your God. It is a knowing that doesn't come by reading or hearing. It's a knowing that comes by experiencing. When you can experience the goodness of God, you can learn to trust him. When you experience God, listen to this. When you experience God winning the battles of your life while you are being still, you're over here just trusting God, and then he also gets to do a miracle in your life and show off. He also gets to answer the prayer because you chose to be still. You chose to obey. You chose to let him win the battle for you. And when that happens, you know what you learn really quickly? how great your God is and how little your anxiety accomplishes, which is to say nothing. And there are so many people I know who wrestle with anxiety, wrestle with stress, wrestle with worry, and it's a real thing, but it's a thing that you allow to grip your heart because you are trying to control your life instead of giving control back to the Father who is in control of everything. So my encouragement to you today is to trust. And I'm not going to admit that it, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's very hard to be still. But trust. Because there are some battles that are just battles for the Lord. You don't have to do it. And when you experience God winning those battles, it'll change your life. So here's the question as we come to a close. The Israelites were under attack. What happened to them? What happened to the fathers and the moms? What happened to the children? What happened to the soldiers who were under attack? What happened to the city of Jerusalem back in 701 BC? Well, luckily, the Bible gives us two different points of view. One is in 2 Kings 19, and the other is in 2 Chronicles 32. And you can take those down, put, take them down if you want to read them on your own time. That's 2 Kings 19, 2 Chronicles 32. Read about it on your own time. It's awesome. It's an awesome story. I encourage you to do it. It's two different points of view. It's the same story, and it tells us what happened when the Assyrians planned their attack. So here's the Assyrians. They're coming. They're planning their attack, and they're marching on Jerusalem. They've sent the tablets ahead. The King Hezekiah, the king of, the Jeru- of Jerusalem, the king of the Jews, he knows what's coming. He knows. And he's scared, and his people are scared. And so you know what he does? He prays to God. He prays one prayer to God. What do you think our God did? I love this part. The God who is always ready to help in times of trouble, the God who is ever-present, the loving God, the God who is our refuge, who is waiting for us to call on him, to call on his name, to seek him in prayer, who is ready to be our fortress, what do you think our God did when King Hezekiah prayed? He answered the prayer. It's amazing. When the king prayed, 
our God sent one angel. The Lord of heaven's armies who is sovereign over everything, who has a vast amount of resources that we could ever imagine. We could never imagine the infinite of his power and will and sovereignty. Yet all he had to do was send one angel and over 185,000 specialized killers, people who had never lost battle, who had never been defeated, never experienced a loss in their lives, were devastated, obliterated, decimated. Because of one angel. God didn't have to send a legion. He didn't have to send a hundred of his best. He didn't have to pick out 20 or 10 or his five favorite. He only had to send one. And that one angel was more than enough to take care of the trouble of the Israelites. It was more than enough to provide them protection. It was more than enough than what they needed. Our God is exactly what we need when he needs him. And his power and his resources are infinitely greater than we could ever imagine. 2,700 years later, here we are, and our God is still answering our prayers. He is still answering the prayers of his people, and he's got the same game plan. He's only sending one. He's answered our trouble. He's answered our problems by sending one, but this time it was not just an angel. This time it was for the whole world, when the entire world was crying out for redemption, when the entire world was saying, death is upon us, God sent one. God answered our prayers by sending the greatest one. God sent salvation. This time, God sent his son. This time, God sent the one to come and rescue us from our trouble, from our pain, to offer us refuge, to be our living stronghold, to be our fortress in the darkness. God sent us Jesus. And some of you, what you need today is a reminder that Jesus is more than enough. Jesus is more than enough. Some of you, what you needed today is an encouragement to hear that the, that the worry that grips your heart, you can find peace from that in Jesus. You don't have to let that rule you anymore. You just need to cling to him in your battle. Some of you need to be told today just, just to cling to the greatest one, that Christ is here. He wants you to call him. Just cling to him in the storm. Just draw near to him. He's ready. He's always present. He's always ready. He's the same God of the Israelites that he is today. He's the same reigning king. He has not changed. He is the sovereign one over everything, and yet he cares about you. That's the goodness of our Lord. Jesus is our refuge. He is our comforter. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is your King. He is your hope when you feel hopeless. He is your provider when you need provision. He is your salvation when you need saved. He is your friend when you are lonely. He is your Savior from yourself. He is your comforter when you have problems and pain. He is your Lord. Can I get an amen, church? Let's wake up today. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our refuge. And the Bible says that when you seek Jesus as your refuge, he will never let you go. Because you are his children now. And he values those who are his kids. You are no longer his enemy. You are no longer the Assyrians. He has now called you his own. He has now rescued you from yourself. And you are now standing in his refuge in the fortress with him. And he is loving you and he wants to take care of you. And all we have to do is just be still and trust. Because there are some battles you don't have to fight because Jesus already won it for you on the cross. Tomorrow is not that bad when I've got eternity with the Lord. Now, there might be some of you who have never sought Christ as your Lord. You've never accepted Christ as your Savior. You've never accepted that free gift. Maybe you've been coming to church for years. And yet you still try to do life by your power. You're still trying to put it on all on you. Today, I want to encourage you, make Christ your king. Seek Christ as your refuge. Be still and dwell in his presence. For Jesus is our refuge. Today, I want to encourage you, if you've never accepted the gift of salvation, I want you to pray with me today, and, and I want to encourage you to do it. I want you to be bold today. I want you to step out in faith and seek the Lord as your refuge. In fact, I want the whole church, let's all bow our heads together. Let's all close our eyes and let's all pray together as one church out loud 
so that those who are about to step into the decision of saving faith to make Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior, to find him as a refuge, could be bold enough to do it. So let's pray together. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins so that I could live with you for eternity in heaven. I ask for forgiveness of my sins that you may be the Lord of my life. I give my life to you, Jesus. And I accept you as my King and Savior. And I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.